All right. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. First of all, we'd like to thank our sponsors and our hosts, Mr. and Mrs. Isaac and Esther Soleimani, Tizkul and Mitzvot. Thank you very much for opening up your home to us. Uh, again, Bliya and Aram, your home always be open for smachot, for happy occasions, and for bracha and mazal, B'zad Hashem, only good news. Thank you so much. So today, B'zad Hashem, uh, we're going to be continuing our series on the Rambam's 13 Principles of Faith. We started last time with an introduction to the 13 Principles. The idea, generally speaking, was that uh, our job, of course, as Jewish people, is to make it to the world to come. We know that life is temporary. It's 120 years. And afterwards, it's a lifetime of eternity for those who, who, who get there. So our job is to get there. And we said that the Mishnah tells us that everybody, every Jew has a portion in the world to come. Some people have bigger portions, some have smaller portions. Everyone has a portion, right? But the question is, what does it, what is required to have that portion? Says the Mishnah, Yisrael. as long as you have the title of Yisrael. Yisrael means this guy or this woman, they're, they're a Jewish person. They, they are in the fold of the Jewish faith, so to say. But if you have a person who decides to remove that title from himself, uh, which means, and by the way, that's not to the exclusion of Goyim. It's very clear that a Goy who is a tzaddik, like Hasidu Mota Olam, also has a portion in the world to come. Um, that's important to note as well. But as far as Jews are concerned, the main thing is not to blow it, not to remove the title of Israel from a person. So we spoke last time about a person that decides to, let's say, take a different attitude of, let's say, being an atheist or uh, denying certain of basic tenets of, of our faith, that that could potentially remove the concept of Yisrael from himself, and therefore he would lose his share in the world to come, which is a very sad thing. Today, I want to zone in on the first principle, which we learned last time, and that is the idea, the most fundamental principle, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu exists. Now, we're not just going to talk about HaKadosh Baruch Hu existing, but rather we're going to zone in on the idea that the Rambam is talking about, which is the idea that not only does Hashem exist, but Hashem is the source of everything. And we're going to, I'm going to read you the Rambam inside, and we're going to develop the idea in general. We're going to talk about where did we see this in history, about people who went against the concept, and how does this relate to us practically, B'zad Hashem, as far as we're concerned, what is it that we can do with this concept in our own lives? Bezal uh, Hashem will get to all of that. Hashem, Hashem, not seven, not six. Says the says the Rambam. Lehaamin metziut habore itbarach. So the first principle, Hayesod Arishon, the first foundation of all these principles is to believe in the existence of the Creator. May His name be blessed. Vehu, and this is this means. That exists something that is whole in every sense of, of everything, in, any, in every way. He is the reason for everything that exists, period. Through him, those things exist. Because of him, they, they are. Ve'ali ale ala lev he'ader metziuto. A person should never think that Hashem has removed himself from the world. Ki be'he'edar metziuto. If Hashem were to do that, then nidbatel metziut kol animtzaim. Then everything would cease to exist. Ve'lo nish'ar nimtza she'itkayem metziuto. Nothing else would be able to survive if not for Hashem. Meaning, Hashem is the source of everything, and we need Hashem. Everything else needs Hashem. Hashem does not need us. Now, let me try and explain what the Rambam is telling us over here. The concept that the Rambam is referring to, I think it can be compared to any kind of an appliance. Let's talk about a refrigerator for a second. A refrigerator, obviously, makes things cold, right? How do you, how does the refrigerator work? It has to be plugged into the outlet, right? You gotta plug the fridge into the outlet. What happens is 
the outlet is the source of power that comes into the refrigerator, gets the motor running, makes the compressor work, and cold air comes out. If you were for a second to unplug that refrigerator, it might stay cool for a little bit, but eventually it's going to get hot. What's the reason for that? For that, because it's disconnected to its source of power. That's the idea. We say every day in our prayers that Hakadosh Baruch Hu is mechadesh betuvo bechol yom tamid maaseh bereshit. This means Hashem is the is recreating every day the creation. What does that mean? The idea is that Hakadosh Baruch Hu not only recreates the creation every day. But just like that plug, just like that, uh, just like that refrigerator is plugged into the outlet, so every second there's a life source, there's a source of energy, there's a source of, of power coming to that refrigerator, so too there must be a source that comes that, of power that comes into the world, that gives life to the world. Meaning like this. This is a concept from the Tanya, by the way. He explains this at great length. This table that we're sitting at right now, this table has in it a divine energy of a Kadosh Baruch Hu that gives it life every moment. We have a divine energy of a Kadosh Baruch Hu that gives us life every minute. If that divine energy would cease to exist for just a second, if Hashem would unplug us, so to say, automatically, we're all done. Right now we're here because we're plugged in. That's the only way. Because what is that plug? It's an interesting thing. We say... Uh, on Yom Kippur, on Rosh Hashanah, we, we take out the, um, the Sefer Torah from the Yom Kodesh, we say 12 times, Le'olam Hashem, Devarcha Nitzav Bashamayim. Remember that line? What does that mean? It means forever, Hashem, your words stand in heaven. What does that mean? So the simple explanation that we always give is that when it's Rosh Hashanah, it's Yom Kippur, so there's a judgment that's going on at that time. And if, God forbid, it's not a favorable one, so we're praying when we take out the Sefer Torah, Hashem, keep that judgment in Shemaim. Le'olam Hashem, Hashem, forever keep that bad judgment if it's not in our favor. Keep it there. Don't send it down here. That's the simple explanation of what those words mean. But the Balatanya explains it a little bit differently, and it's also equally as important to have this in mind as well when we say those words. Le'olam Hashem, forever Hashem, devarcha, your words, which means the words that you used when you created this world, for example, yehi or, may there be light, let there be light, or uh, when Hashem created uh, man, na'ase adam b'tzalmen, let there be men in our image. So Hashem used words to create this world. So those very words, we're praying, Hashem, those very words, which are the outlets, the spiritual outlets that we are plugged into right now, they are the source of power that give us life, give us life, that, that give the entire creation life. Hashem, keep them running. Don't unplug us. Le'olam Hashem, devarcha, those words, nitzav b'shamayim, let them stay in heaven and keep giving us life, keep get, putting energy into the creation. Because if you stop putting energy into the creation for even a split second, we're done. That's the meaning, says the Rambam, of the first principle. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the reason for every single thing that exists in the world. The sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, the earth, everything. And he continues to pump energy into that creation. If it were to stop for a second, then it would cease to exist. But Hashem would continue to exist just like the person exists after he unplugs the refrigerator. He's around, but the fridge is not working anymore. That's the idea. Is it clear? Everyone clear? 100%? Yeah? Any questions? We're good. Okay, excellent. Very good. This is a very important concept. The idea, that's what we mean when we say in our davening, Hashem recreates the world every second, meaning the same energy. That was, that was there at the time of creation, that very same energy is continuing to flow into the creation every second, because if not, it would cease to exist automatically. Okay, so that's the first very important point that we have to talk about. Now, 
it's our job to point out a couple of places in the Tanakh where we saw people try to go against this concept. The, the generation of the flood, we know, went very much against the will of Hashem. They did a lot of things that went contrary to what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted us to do. As you all know, there was a lot of immorality as far as, uh, as far as relations, as far as stealing, as far as all kinds of different things that they did in order to uh, fulfill their lust and their desires, and they went against the will of Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu famously punished them with a flood, and everyone died except for Noah, etc. And then at the end of Parashat Noah, you find a really interesting story. And it's one that is a big question mark. You don't really know what to make of it. It's a story at the end of Parashat Noah about people that got together. They said, they said, let's make a big tower. The famous story of the Migdal Bavel. Let us make, you know, let's make bricks and we'll build a tower. We'll build a city around the tower. The head of the tower will reach heaven. We'll make for ourselves a great name. Because if not, we might get dispersed throughout the whole world. And that's all it says. It says then, HaKadosh Baruch Hu went, saw what they did, decided to disperse them, decided to change their language. And that's all. We don't really know much more than that from the Sukim. So Rashi says something kind of interesting. They wanted to wage war on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So we hear that. And you say to yourself, what does that mean? So they thought that if they make this huge tower, that they could climb up to heaven and they could find them somewhere and then try to, I don't know, do something. To, like, what, what were they thinking? What's the idea? It's a kind of elementary way of looking at it. That you're saying that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is up there. We have to build this tower to climb all the way up there. And then when we get there, we're done. We can find him. We can get him. And then we can do whatever we want. Really? That's an odd it's, a, it's, it's almost, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? If you have an understanding that like, who created heaven, earth, star, sky, moon, I mean, there is no, you know, you can fly very high up in the sky. It's not, you're not going to find Hashem. It doesn't like one of the principles is there's no body to Hashem. So what was the plan, right? The question is clear, right? Okay, so the question here, I think is, is, is very, I think everyone has this question. So I saw, I've seen different answers in the past. I'll share with you one answer from the great of Moshe Shapiro, Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Livracha. And he explains the following. He explains, based on where they went, it says that they went to a place called Eretz Shinar. They went uh, eastward. They found a valley, Be'eretz Shin'ar. And Rashi says over there, the land of Shin'ar stands for the idea, Shinina'aru Metei Hamabul. That after the, uh, after the flood, the people that died in the flood, they all kind of piled up in that valley over there, which is a very strange, very scary thought to see that. But that's where they were. Moshe Shapiro explains that this is a message that they were trying to learn from the failure of the generation of the flood. The generation of the flood wanted to do what they wanted to do. They didn't want to do what Hashem wanted them to do. They wanted to do their own thing. But they failed miserably. Look, they got flooded. They, were, they all died. So they had to come up with a plan that they should be able to do what they feel like they want to do without having to be uh, subjected to the will of Hashem, but at the same time, not get flooded or not get punished in a, in a way like that. So they had to come up with a plan. They had to learn from the mistake of the generation of the flood and then fix that so that they could, in their own way, rebel against Hashem. This was the goal of the what we call the Dora Palaga, the generation of the dispersal, that eventually they were dispersed. So explains of Moshe Shapiro, this is what they had in mind. 
Zohar Kadosh tells us it was a very good plan, the best plan that you could come up with, but it was flawed at its base. And the plan was the following. As we said before, the will of Hashem, the energy that HaKadosh Baruch Hu pumps into the creation is what gives life to everything. There, there is nothing else in the world besides for the energy of Borei Olam. And they understood that. They understood that if you defy the will of Hashem, you're going to get punished. And there, that's not going to be good for you. Okay, so that's not an option. But what if we could take the will of Hashem and change it so that it works out with what we want? Maybe there's a way that we can actually take God's will and turn it around to be that Hashem by default has to desire what we want. Is there a way that we can do that? So they decided the following. Hashem gave us freedom of choice, freedom of the, the free will. We can do whatever we want. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the freedom to do whatever it is that we want. We know that Hashem at the same time has a reality, that the reality is whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, that's the reality of the world. But being that we have free will, perhaps if we all use our free will at the same time together as one unit, to go in a different direction. In other words, we're going to build a tower. The tower is not to climb up high. That's not the point of the tower. The tower is a place that we can all revolve around this one thing together, united as one group, where we use our free will to decide against what Hashem wants. That all of us, all of humanity together, all of us unite around one concept that we don't want to do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to do. We all unite around that. And at that moment, being that we have taken our free will and used it in a certain way, so now HaKadosh Baruch Hu will have no other choice but to agree with us. He gave us the free will to choose. We chose. And this is what we decided. We're all now around this one unified idea of doing what we want. And they felt that if they do that, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu by default has to agree with them. Because Hashem gave them that option. So now they're not going against the will of Hashem. They're going to do what they want. And Hashem has to agree with them. Because Hashem created in this world the ability, the opportunity for us to make decisions. And based on those decisions, to do certain things that will, that will actually change, quote unquote, the will of Hashem. If we all are united. Meaning, so long as there's a guy named Noach that wants to do what Hashem wants them to do, right? Hashem wants Noach to be a tzaddik. So there's a guy out there that's saying, hey, you guys, you guys are doing things that are wrong. So then the will of Hashem could still survive, right? Against everybody else. It might just be one guy, but it's still the will of Hashem versus everybody else. So it doesn't work. But here it's everybody. All of us together, there's nobody that wants to do what Hashem wants them to do. So if that's what we accomplished, then by default, the new reality is that the will of Hashem actually becomes the will of the people. And that's, that was the plan. It's an interesting idea. Now, if that's the plan, then, you know, potentially they might think that, uh, that it could work. The problem is like this. The flaw of this plan was that what they didn't understand is that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is not, did not create a world in which he gave people the freedom of choice, but then left and then stopped being in control of the world and then separated from the world. It's not like the reality that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in charge of everything could change. In other words, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is still able to disperse them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is still able to do whatever is necessary to stop them. It's a kind of a tricky concept to, to I'm, I'm admitting. It's not the easiest concept, what he's explaining. But at the same time, that's what happened, explains Rav Moshe Shapiro. And what he's telling us is, is that when a Kadosh Baruch Hu went down and dispersed them, what he was showing them is that it's impossible to unite around an idea 
of going against HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You won't let it happen. You won't let it happen. You think that you could change your reality, but it's not possible to change your reality. You think that it's possible to take away the source. You think it's possible to unplug and to still live? It's not possible. That, that was the flaw. That's where they went wrong. So over here we find in Tanakh a group that decided to go against this first principle, to go against the idea that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the source of everything and to try and to change that. And they were taught that it's impossible. And how did Hashem teach them that? By dispersing them. By now you can't even understand what your fellow is saying. He's speaking one language, he's speaking a different language. You don't even understand each other. So the only thing that you could unite around is that we want to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's that was, the, that was the message here. So that explains what Moshe Shapiro is an example of people that wanted to go against this first principle of the Rambam, what he was explaining. Another example. We know throughout the Tanakh, throughout the period of the Talmud, there was a concept called Kishuf. Kishuf is sorcery, witchcraft. It's the ability to tap into certain spiritual powers and to use them for your benefit. So, for example, people used to worship idols because the idols, they weren't dumb. They wouldn't just bow down to a piece of wood. They did things that caused the idols to give them special information. Like if you would worship the idol, you know, you might find out the winning lottery numbers and become rich. Right. You might find out that there's a you know, treasure over here or there's. Uh, something over there, it would actually give information to people. It was a very powerful thing. So people used to do a lot of witchcraft and sorcery. The most famous one that we knew was Bilam. Bilam used to tap into these spiritual powers. He would curse a nation and he would completely destroy them. It's very powerful. It was a very big temptation. People used to really buy into it. And it was a big job to be able to hold yourself back and to say, no, this is wrong. This is all fake. It's not real. There's HaKadosh Baruch Hu and there's nothing else. It was, a big, it was a big nisayon. The Gemara tells us that Rav Ashi one time got up and uh, said, we're going to have a class tomorrow about our friend Menashe. Menashe was one of the worst kings that ever lived. He, he killed many people. He brought Avodah Zarah, idol worship, into the Beta Mikdash. He was a terrible, terrible king. And that night he had a dream about King Menashe. And Menashe came to him and he told him, why are you talking about me like that? And he said, you're a big rasha, wicked man. Why shouldn't I speak about that, about you like that? And he said, I'm a king. And he said, let me tell you something. If you would have lived in my generation, you would have lifted up your jalabiya, which is that long coat they would wear. And you would have run to the closest idol and bowed down and kissed it. Because that's what you would have done if you lived in my generation. Because it was a very a strong pull to the to, to the Abu Dazara. It was a real Yetzirah to it. it. It really made itself appear real. Like it's talking to you, like it's doing things. It says about the, the golden calf that, that it was Shor uh, Chel Esev. It was walking around, it was eating the grass, whatever was around. It, it looked real. You know, it's fake, but it looked real. So what is it exactly? What is it? How does it work? So the Nefesh HaChaim, Chaim Volajner, points out in Perek, in Sha'ar Gimel Perek Yudbet. And he says, the Gemara tells us the word Kshafim is an acronym, Shemakhishim Pamalya Shilmala, which means Kshafim are so strong that they can even weaken the, 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 the heavenly family, Pamalya Shilmala. What does that mean? Sounds like the, the sorcery is so strong that it can even be more powerful than, than heaven. What does that mean? How do you understand that? So Reb Chaim Balajner explains the following. Reb Chaim Balajner explains that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put into, into motion that there are certain things in the, in the Shamaim, celestial beings that we call mazalot. It could be, it could be uh, different stars, like we always talk about horoscopes and stuff like that, that they have a certain effect on people when they're born, based on the time that they're born. There are all kinds of things that, different powers that, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu set into motion in this world. 
part of those powers are what we call kuchot atum'ah, which means powers of impurity, the ability to tap into forces that are for sources of impurity, to use them, to draw strength from them, and to do all kinds of things with help from them. It's not wise, because after a person passes away, it says they come back and they, they seek payment for it, so it's not a good idea, but a person could use it in this world to, to get a lot of different things. So much so that it's makhish pamalia shilmala. What does that mean? Rabbi Chaim Velazhner explains it could potentially have an effect on, on the other celestial beings that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put into motion in the world. It's possible. So it does have an effect. But, explains Rabbi Chaim Velazhner, but chas v'shalom to think that for a second that it has any kind of effect on Hashem. Rabbi Chaim Hu is in charge and above of overseeing everything, allowing this to happen and allowing that to happen. For, not for a second is Hashem out of the picture. Hashem is in charge of every little thing. And that's what the parasha that we are reading this week actually tells us. You have been informed, Hashem says, Ki Hashem hu ha'elokim, that Hashem is God, en od milvado. There is nothing else besides for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That means that even if somebody has the incredible power of sorcery, even if somebody knows what to do, he's got the strength. He understands. For example, Bil'am had the knowledge of the split second in the day that Hashem's anger is in total control, at which point he would say a curse, even a very small curse. And at that point, the devastation would take place. So he knows, he's aware, he's in, very good. But if HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want that to happen, then Hashem changes it. Hashem turned around the curse to a blessing. HaKadosh Baruch Hu allows these things to happen. It's a, it's a test for people. But Hashem, if Hashem doesn't want it to happen, automatically He doesn't let it happen, just like the Dora Palaga, like the generation of the dispersal. So what I'm trying to get at is Rabotai, a very interesting Gemara that Rav Chaim brings down. The Gemara tells us, this is a piece of Talmud on Daf Samech Zayin Amud Bet of Masechet Sanhedrin. A very interesting story. There was a particular woman that used to do sorcery on people. Now, there are different tools, different, different ways that a person could have control over someone. For example, interestingly enough, the Gemara says, you know, back in the times of the Talmud, when they went number two, they would either wipe themselves with shards of pottery or with stones. So the Gemara says, very important, always use stones. Don't use pottery. Why? Because first of all, pottery can hurt you, number one. Number two, you are susceptible to sorcery. A sorcerer or witch could actually do witchcraft and could control you. That's if you use pottery, but not if you use stones. That's what, that's what it says. Okay. Another thing is that if a witch would be able to take the dust from underneath your feet, dust that you walked on, they could control you. Okay. Fine. That's what it says in the Gemara. So there was a particular woman that the great Rabbi Hanina one day was walking and this woman grabbed dust from under his feet. And he realized what she's trying to do. She's trying to take this dust so that she can control him. She can harm him. It's very, very dangerous. So Rabbi Hanina looked at her and he said, Tereshkoli, take it. No, don't worry. Lo You're, it's not going to work for you. So he said, En od milvadok tiv. It says in the Torah, in our parsha this week, that there's nothing else besides for Hashem. So the Gemara there says that's the story. But the Gemara has a question. He says, I don't understand. Didn't we just say a minute ago that why is the, why is the word for witchcraft in Hebrew, kshafim? Kshafim because makhishim pamalia shelmala. The witchcraft is so strong, it can even weaken the heavens. So why was he so sure of himself that nothing will happen to him? Says the Gemara, no. Because Shani Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Hanina is different. Nafish zechute. He had a lot of merit. He had a lot of zechuyot. So that's why he wasn't worried. 
So Chaim Balazhina asks, what does that mean? He has a lot of merit. Really, the sorcery could get him. The witchcraft could get him. But he had a lot of merit, so it couldn't get him. Anybody else, yes, but not him. So what does that mean? That he was so sure of himself, that he's such a tzaddik, that because I'm such a big tzaddik, therefore the witchcraft can't get me? What was, what was the idea there? Explains of Chaim Balazhin a very important point. And from this, everybody, I'm going to share with you a really really important and powerful skula that everybody should know, okay? Really important. Says, says Rabbi Chaim Balazhna, I'll read you the words inside. He says, Rabbi Chanina, lo torato Rabbi Chanina was not trusting in the fact that he knows so much Torah, in the fact that he has done wonderful mitzvot, that wasn't why he was so sure that nothing would happen. Rather, Rak, Sheyada Veshi'er Benafsho, Rabbi Chanina knew about himself. He was able to, to know himself well enough to know that he is able to, Shezota Emuna, that the faith that he has in Hashem is Amita. It's established in his heart truly. He truly has a close connection. He has, a, he has an established faith of Hashem in his heart. What's that faith? Like it says in our parasha. She'en od milvado yitbarach shum koach klal. That besides for Hashem, may he be blessed, there is no force at all in the world. He knows that. Besides for Hashem, there's nothing, no other force in the world. No sorcery, no witchcraft, no nothing. And that he was able to glue himself with his thought to Bala to, Kochot, to the one who is in charge of all forces. The only master who fills all the worlds. There is nothing, there's no strength, there's no control by any other force whatsoever. He knew this. He felt it wholeheartedly. He knew he could attach his thought to that concept. Lachen, that's why. He had no doubts whatsoever. That the, that the sorcery would have no effect on him. That these types of kochot that come from impurity would have absolutely no effect on him whatsoever. That's why he told her, Lo mistaya miltech. It won't work for you, he told her. En od milvadoktiv. It says that there is nothing else besides for Boe Olam. Nothing else. Nothing can harm me. Abutai. That explains Rabbi Chaim Volozhner was Rabbi Chanina was. Was, was counting on the idea that if a person is ever faced with any kind of threat, with any kind of issue, God forbid that we should never have such things. But if a person attaches his thought to the idea that there's nothing else in the world besides for Borei Olam, doesn't matter if the person knows how to tap into this type of strength of impurity, doesn't know if the person has, it doesn't matter if he has Abu Dazara backing him up, nothing else matters. If I attach my thought to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then I know that I'm safe. Very, very important to be aware of this. Now, guys, I want to read you this word from Rabbi Chaim Balazhna, this paragraph. Everybody needs to know this. Everybody needs to know this. Okay, this is very practical for all of us. Pay careful attention to the words of Rabbi Chaim Balazhna. gadol Says Reb Chaim Belajaner, you should know it's a great principle and it's a wonderful sgula. Lehaser ulevatel mealav kol dinin urtsonot acherim. A person has the ability to remove from himself any kind of bad decree or any kind of negative will from other people. Shelo yuchlu lishlot bo a way to get them not to be able to control you. 
ולא יעשו שום רושם כלל, that he shouldn't have any effect on you whatsoever. כשהאדם קובע בליבו לאמור, when you establish firmly in your heart, saying, הלא השם הוא האלוקים האמיתי, that השם is the true God, ואין עוד מלבדו יתברך שום כוח בעולם וכל העולמות כלל, and you say to yourself, there is nothing else in the world besides for Hashem, no other force, no other strength in the world whatsoever. Everything, הכל מלא רק אחדותו, פשוט יתברך שמו. Like we said, you remember, you recall that this table is all energy of Hashem, that my body is all energy from Hashem, that this soda over there is all energy from Borei Olam, that nothing exists in the world besides for Borei Olam. When you remember that, and you attach yourself to that thought, ומבטל בליבו ביטול גמור, ואינו משגיח כלל על שום כוח ורצון בעולם, and therefore you dismiss any other strength or force in the world, ומשעבד ומדבק תואר מחשבתו רק לאדון יחיד ברוך הוא, and you attach and you glue your, your pure thought to Hashem, he says, this is what Hashem does in return. כן יספיק הוא יתברך בידו, שממילא יתבטלו מעליו כל הכוחות והרצונות שבעולם. At that point Hashem says, if that's what he is doing, he's attaching himself to me, he understands there's nothing else in the world besides for me, then Hashem gets rid of everything that's coming against you. רבותיי, do you understand what I'm saying? ראש ברוך הוא has the ability to get to, to uh, you, you have the ability by tapping into this idea, to get rid of everything that's coming against you. Everything. Because you're saying to yourself, there's nothing else besides for Borei Olam. שלא יוכלו לפעול לא שום דבר כלל. They will not be able to touch you even this much. That's the power of this principle of the Rambam. That's what we're learning. When you understand this principle of the Rambam, when you understand what it means, that there's nothing else besides for Borei Olam, you have the ability to get rid of everything. That's what the, unfortunately, the Dora Palaga missed, and those sorcerers missed. They missed this concept, but we're not missing the concept. And I'm going to share with you a couple of stories of great Sadiqim that they had this in mind, this exact paragraph I just read for you from Rabbi Chaim Belajaner in mind, and it worked incredible miracles for them. It's a story about Reb Chaim Belajner's son, the, uh, the uh, Reb Yosef Dov Salvechik, the Be- Beta Levi. And the Beta Levi was once approached by a guy who heard that there are people, the customs agents are going around town and they're looking for smuggled merchandise. Uh, they heard that a big shipment had come in and they want to, uh, they're going to take to Siberia anybody who is caught with smuggled merchandise. Now, this guy's store was 100% smuggled merchandise. Everything, every single thing there. Now, why? Machshmam, they were anti-Semites. They taxed people 60, 70% of their uh, income. He had no choice. He, the only way to survive was to do that. Okay, so that's what he did. But now they're after him. And what does he do? So the brisker, the brisker of, uh, meaning the first brisker of, of uh, the Bet, Bet Levi rather, was there. And he told them, have in mind this concept. Have in mind. En od milvado. Have in mind, there's nothing else besides for Borei Olam. You'll see. Just attach yourself to that concept. You'll see everything will be fine. Two hours later, the wife of this store owner came to the rabbi and told him, everything is fine. The officers were going down the block. They went from store to store to store. They skipped our store. They skipped it. Amazing. Uh, it, goes, it goes even further. The, the brisk rub that we all know is a brisk rub, uh, Velvel Soloveitchik, was, was fleeing in World War II from Warsaw to Vilna. He was with his son, Rebbeau. Zecher Tzadik Divracha. And they knew about this paragraph. They had the Kabbalah from their father, from their grandfather, about this concept. And they had it in mind the entire time as they were fleeing. 
All they were doing was thinking about the idea that in old milvado, there's nothing else besides for Boyola. And no harm came to them. For about two minutes, they stopped. They were involved in something else. And a Nazi officer goes onto their train and starts walking down. They realized what had happened. And they went back to doing their thing about thinking that there's nothing else besides for Boyola Olam. The Nazi officer got all the way to the last car and then turned around and went back, went back out. Amazing, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Also, that's how he got away from uh, being enlisted in the Russian army. They say that also the same idea. Chaim Brisker, his father, told him, you have to have this in mind. And they didn't enlist him into the army, into the Russian army. There are many, many, many other stories like this. Aaron of Bells as well was inches away from a, from a Nazi officer. And again, he had this in mind, the first Bells Rebbe, and Nazis just turned around and left him. It's, I can tell you, it's, it's an amazing thing. But where does this come into fruition with us? How does this make us, what does this have to do with us? I think on a practical level, I will tie, this is how you're supposed to pray. This is how you're supposed to pray to Hashem. When you need something, person needs something. We all need things. We all want Zad Hashem to have nachat from the kids. We all know, we all need so many different needs that are out there. People that need children, people need shiduchim, people need parnasa, people need, I mean, endless amount of needs. The way to pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is this. This is how you have to do it. You have to turn to Hashem in a way where you are able to clearly establish in your mind that I need something right now and I have no other way of getting it besides turning to Hashem because Hashem is everything. It's not the connections that I have. It's not the people that I know. It's not the other things that perhaps might get me what I'm looking for. The conversation with him, the money in the bank, the, none of that is relevant. What is relevant is that only Akadosh Baruch Hu is in charge and only Akadosh Baruch Hu can get me what I need right now. That's it. When you pray like that, those prayers go straight to Hashem. And that's how you do it. You pray with tears. You have to cry. And tell Akadosh Baruch Hu, I know that only you are in charge. Only you can give this to me. Nobody else. No other phone calls to other people. We put so much hope in our phone calls to this guy, a conversation with that guy. And we think that all of that is what's going to make it happen. And it's so far from the truth. That's our job. To turn to Boi to pray to Boi this way. And when you do it this way, you get results. That's what has to happen. So Rabotai, I want to leave you with this, with this final thought. This is what the Rambam is telling us. That every single thing around us, whatever we have, is all Borei Olam. There's no other force. There's nothing else that can do anything to you. You are completely protected on one condition. That you attach your thought. You attach yourself to HaKadosh Baruch Hu all the time. And that way, that way, B'zal Hashem will be able to see Lots of blessings in our lives. Lots of brachot and atzlacha for everybody. Zad Hashem. But it's all really dependent upon this one principle. Rosh Baruch should help us all to be matzliach, to see brachot, yeshuot, and only good news. Chazakim ruchim, guys. Thank you for joining us. If we have any questions, more than welcome to, uh, to ask. Yes. So